Hello Hi and there. welcome. We hope you uh, recognize the headline on the slide here and you find yourself in the, the right virtual event. We're starting up in uh, just a minute and we'll actually go pretty straight to it. But uh, before we do so, uh, we're just going to tell you a little bit about like who we are. So um, I'm Lasse and this is Henrik. And uh, we call ourselves like innovation and business building nerds. And we work with a lot of companies uh, combining strategy and innovation into new business creation. But enough about us. That's not why you're here. Let's get uh, to the beef, Henrik. All right. And the beef is build your next business before someone else does it. This session is going to be about why you should do it and it's going to be about how you should do it. But first to the why. Why even bother? Well, do it because you want to secure future growth and profits of your company. Average corporate lifespan is down tremendously over the years. Do it also to defend against disruption. We see now the startup power is up more than ever before. And then you have the titans such as Amazon, Apple and Google all trying to eat your lunch. Do it also to attract and keep employees of the future. Great young people are increasingly turning their back to corporates. Studies show this. But you may know all of these things. At least I've heard them a ton of times. So therefore, we also advise you to reflect upon what company is it actually you want to have in five to 10 years? And what personal dent do you want to make in the world? Building new business is actually not rocket science, but studies show that more than 90% of corporate innovation fails. It fails it because it does not achieve the desired outcome and it leaves the company more vulnerable to disruption. It wastes significant resources and human engagement due to innovation theater, wrong process, or unrealistic expectations. Thus, we'd like to inspire you with some of our experience. And we had the stepping stones to new business in the middle part of this rocket. And they are discover customer problems worth solving, generate a portfolio of solutions and design a roadmap, launch and validate the very first version of your business, and then grow or scale the business. On the side, we have the fuel, the energy that is necessary to create lift. First, why even create new business or defend the core? We just touched upon that. Towards the end of the session, we'll talk about the second fuel tank, the team and process power necessary to get you going. But first, we'll move into the four stepping stones, starting with discover. To find problems worth solving, some initial strategic assessment is helpful but not a heavy piece of strategic truth telling, just enough to look roughly in the right direction. Because all of this is actually built in in the process afterwards. We advise you to look at four or five strategic question, your winning aspiration, where to play, how to win, what capabilities and what systems. The first one winning aspiration is usually very broad for most companies, something like making the world a better place. So we'd like to look into where to play right now. And here below, you see a growth matrix. You might know it. It actually shows customer in one axis and then uh, solutions and capabilities on the other axis. So the vertical axis is expansion at current customers with new solutions. The horizontal axis is expansion with current solutions into new customer segments. If we take a look at the vertical first, address customers of current or address problems of current customers with new solutions. There are a number of great companies who've been skillful in doing this. And I'd like to mention Ambu. That's a company that makes intubation tubes for hospital operating procedures. And doctors had the problem that it was really hard to position those tubes without damaging the throat and the face of the patients. So Ampo, they came up with a single use throat camera and now they have a 2 billion DKK business for visualization products. 
B, the horizontal move using existing capabilities to solve problems for new customers. Here, there's also a lot of great examples. And one I'd like to mention that most people know is Dyson. Their unique skills around airflow enable them to actually move into hand dryers and a lot of other applications and markets. Right now, I'd like to double click on those two directions and move a little bit into the how. So whether it's customer or capability focus, you must end up with validated problems in this phase of your process. On customer focus, it is a good idea to take a look a look with the eyes of your customer at the user journey, all the way from desire through acquisition, usage and recycling. Typically, we're very focused on the usage part. That's where our core product features usually work. But it would be a great question to ask how, can, how to make the end-to-end -end experience better for the customer. Likewise, on the customer folks, we can take an even bigger look and look at the customer system objectives. And typically you'll find that that segment or unit at the customer, your, your solution is only sort of fixing a small part of this. So you could ask yourself here is to, you know, can you move upwards or sidewards from where you are currently? That'll also enable you to find a lot of new problems. So the question here, how to help the customer achieve their system objectives. If we move into capability focus, it makes sense, of course, to start looking at your capabilities. Uh, and uh, it would be uh, fair to look at what are your strengths. And sometimes uh, it's not objective. So it's very important to be objective here. And one good way of doing that is actually to ask customers and partners. It would also make a lot of sense to look at what is the transferability of those skills, uh, modularity and flexibility. And a lot of uh, people or a lot of companies have done this well. Uh, I'd like to mention Amazon. When they found that they are really good at hosting and cloud solutions, they created Amazon Web Services and went to a lot of new markets. Likewise with Garmin, uh, when they were challenged in the automotive navigation sector, they moved into a, to a wearables, fitness equipment and stuff like that. When we have a view of the company capabilities, we need to match that against industries with problems, so to speak. And this could be industries that are inefficient or have systemic challenges. It could be uh, industries with a high rate of change or high rate of growth, but also it could be underserved or unattractive segments that can be used as a beachhead into something new. And this is much described by Clayton Pistons in an old book uh, where he calls it the low end disruption. Quite interesting though. Whether you take A or B direction, process a little bit similar. You have to generate customer problem assumptions. And this is about what is the cost for the customer, the frequency, the inconvenience uh, of all of this actually happening. And we need to do some light validation of those before we get moving with solution. Don't have to do a, a crazy big piece, but it would be useful to try and validate the, 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 the opportunity buckets here. And when you've done that, it's basically sizing it all up, consolidating it to paint a picture of, of, of the total growth playground playground, you'd say the consolidated customer problem. And with this understanding, it, the solution generation becomes much more interesting and much more valuable. But before Les talks about that, we have a little survey, a little question to ask you. Here goes. Which company do you admire for creating great new business? Write in the chat uh, or just think about it. That's also okay. So we'll let you spend some 30, uh, 30, 40 seconds on that. So please go ahead. 3M, yeah. Yeah, they're good. Tesla, we're gonna, uh, double Tesla. We're gonna dive into that later. I was gonna mention 3M, but I thought everybody- Everybody say it, so yeah. Uh, and there's good. actually also someone yeah. that asked, will the presentation be shared afterwards? It's the username 68569, so maybe it's a bot, but nevertheless, yes, we will share the presentation afterwards. Alibaba, yeah. That's a lot of great stuff here. Sika. It's not a bot. Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> seven, eight, six, you. five, five, five. Toyota, yeah. SpaceX, yeah. From one, no one to market leader, no years. Yeah, amazing story. Higher. Higher. Sabrina, really cool. good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> For sure. 
in DK Vistas. Yeah. But not in UK. That's <laughs> a oh. oh. <laughs> Astra, yes. That's a good one. Uber, Airbnb, yes. Great case. It's great stuff. All right. Thanks for playing along. Uh, I'll think we'll uh, move on to the next iteration. You can keep the commenting uh, going. Yeah, we, we just got the truck. Uh, great job with their camp undo and it's Tim. Okay, you're maybe also a little bit involved. Thank you, Tim. Uh, great. <laughs> Let's move to uh, to the next iteration. If you have you know problems that are worth solving, you can move on to the next part, but only if you found problems worth solving. And that's solution mode. And we all love that, right? And of course, uh, we could spend uh, hours talking about the science and practice behind you know solution ideation. But today we actually won't because we're going to focus on something uh, else that most companies skip or at least undervalue significantly. And that is that instead of thinking about how to come up with the best solution, we'll talk about how to come up with a portfolio of solution ideas. And this step involves coming up with a number of different solutions, of course, some that are super hard to do, but they also deliver like the full value proposition that you are planning to deliver. And then, of course, trying to, to come up with solutions that are a little bit more doable, but also only deliver a part of your value proposition and maybe only does that to a smaller segment of your entire total market. And the goal is that you have to come up uh, or identify your end game, which is what we call like the unicorn product, like the big, big vision, and then work your way backwards asking the question, uh, what product generations will we actually launch in the market as several steps towards our vision. And if you're like us, you'll probably uh, find that you need to challenge yourself a lot when coming up with, you know, the really small initial steps, you know, those that only deliver like 20% of your value proposition to a very, you know, small niche market, but that you can get to the market really, really fast. Like your generation ones or some also call them MVPs. This is super unnatural for us to think about. So you might want to challenge yourself there. But before we go into how to do that, why even do this? It seems like a lot of stupid steps if you already know that you have a freaking good idea and all the analysis is just like, it's gonna be a massive hit. I just wanna go for the unicorn. Well, here's a short and fun movie illustrating that point. <laughs> okay, boom. Um, when we do something new, there's a high chance that we'll get a punch in the face. Maybe not one like this where we're sent to the floor more or less uh, permanently, but maybe just a small punch that will actually send us onto the right direction. And instead of trying to avoid these punches, we think we should plan for them. So I guess the, the overall advice here is that you shouldn't choose the ideas with just like the biggest potential on paper. You should choose the one that can take you to the market the fastest. A great example of this is Tesla. And we'll try to jump into this now. Many have criticized Tesla for being you know, an overrated and non-profitable company. Others, they praised them for their ability to actually dream super big and prove their most critical assumptions step by step. So what is their assumption? Well, uh, in short, it is that they want to uh, drive the world's transition towards electrical vehicle. And in their master plan, Musk and company explained that this involved a creating a vehicle, maybe a bit like this, a fully electric and autonomous vehicle. It should be affordable for the masses and it should be even more desirable than a normal combustion engine car. But they couldn't start there. Like they're even not there yet, actually. They had very fundamental things to figure out about their vision and without a lot of money to do so. So they went through an entire roadmap and we'll try to go through it now to figure out how they did this. The first product they introduced to the market for real was actually called the Roadster. And they just took an existing Lotus Elise, a normal car and electrified it. 
and it proved that a small segment would actually pay good money for this new type of product. And of course, they also learn fundamental things about the technology of building electrical vehicles. Okay, on to the next one. It's the Model S. The same luxury segment, it was a really expensive car, it still is. And now it's produced uh, by Tesla themselves from the bottom. And it also included a network of charging stations to overcome a key concern for uh, the customers buying this as their daily driver. Third product, uh, in my opinion, actually uh, constituted a small punch in the face. And that's the Model X, the big SUV with uh, the Falcon doors that opened like this. Uh, I think most of us know it. It wasn't the hit seller uh, they hoped it would be. And it also, you know, sort of constituted a, a great learning for them about how, you know, difficult and, and sort of unstable a technology can be compared to the actual customer value it delivered. So back to the plan, they launched the Tesla Model 3. It was a make or break point for Tesla. Why? Well, they moved beyond the luxury segment. Uh, this is a more affordable car. Those uh, expectations towards uh, volumes were much, much higher. Plus, this was the first time Tesla planned to become profitable as a company with the introduction of the Gigafactory where a lot of the production of the Tesla Model 3 actually was uh, automated. The fifth product was the, the Model Y they brought to market. Um, and this was probably not a part of their original roadmap. This is probably just an iteration of the Tesla Model 3 because they realized that customer preference changed from sedans and station cars to crossovers and SUVs. And right now the Model Y and the Tesla uh, Model 3 uh, is actually fighting for, for sort of the place in the portfolio of Tesla for the, you know, the big volume seller. So what's next? Well, maybe it's the unicorn uh, version up there. Uh, right now, Tesla is experimenting with taking the battery production in-house, thus being able to create even more affordable cars. Okay, this could just be, you know, a, a really nice story, right? But just look at the stock price of Tesla. It's higher than any other car company out there, not because they sell more cars, or because they have a better profit margin, but because the market believe in their vision and their ability to prove this vision step by step. And we're not saying that you have to be just like Elon Musk uh, and, and sort of dream as big and visionary as him, but we do say that you should be inspired by the way that he takes products to the market. Cool. Once you have a roadmap that you believe in, it's time for the next iteration. And that is to launch the first version of your business fast. But hold on. I thought that launch was usually the end for most innovation and product development projects, right? Like we plan for it to be the end. We budget for it to be the end. The team that is doing this is often staffed on other projects. You know, sometimes even before we launch, because we, we, it, it's going to be a hit, no worries. But why do we actually stop development when we start learning? Like launch of a real product in a real market with real customers paying with real money. That's where real learning starts. And that's why we believe that launch should actually be the beginning and not the end. To sort of truly understand this, we must acknowledge that there's a really, really big difference between what people say they're going to do and what they're going to do. Just think about what we uh, all witnessed. This guy, um, all the best surveys and interview techniques out there predicted that Biden would have an easy win. Well, what happened? You know, we were all biting our nails for an entire week. Of course, in both camps, depending on who your hero is. And the predictions, they were based on what we could call say evidence. That is described as, you know, the opinions that people express. These opinions are often generated in an artificial setting, such as a focus group or in a survey. And saying I'm going to do A or B is totally free. There's no commitment. And most innovation and product development projects today is based on this. We have, for example, an insights department asking an agency to do a segmentation study. They do the segmentation study based on them asking a lot of questions for a lot of people. And 
we just think that this can't be our only thing and we can't trust these things blindly. And this is where we need another source of evidence. Thus, do evidence. Do evidence is facts and events that we can observe. They're generated in a real world setting. So for example, in a store, when negotiating, when shopping online, and actually doing A or B is not free. It requires some skin in the game, your, your money, your time, or whatever it might be. And you either get or painfully acknowledge that you, you know, don't have due evidence when you launch something into the market. And this, of course, enables you to actually make real decisions about whether to change something, you know, your product, the solution you're trying to, uh, to sell, maybe change your market segment, uh, maybe change your business model. Or uh, you can do a decision on killing it, saying even if we change something, we don't believe it will work, let's spend our resources elsewhere or accelerating something that you now have evidence actually is working and then move towards your next generation on your product roadmap. But surely you're thinking out there, there must be a way of de-risking what we're doing before launching something for real in the market. And yes, there is. There is a ton of low cost and low risk experiments that you can carry out before launching to make sure that you know you 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 have covered all the the right assumptions about desirability if somebody wants it viability if we should build it because we can make a business out of it and feasibility if we can build it and here they are all the experiments and if you're like most companies you are super good already today at testing feasibility thoroughly before launching. Quality is in top. But here's just a couple of examples uh, of uh, some, some experiments that you could do to test desirability, both in a B2B and a B2B setting. The first one is fake door split testing. Okay, let's say you want to go into the headphone industry. Uh, you're in a B2B setting. You have a, a million of potential customers. Uh, but you don't know if the, these customers would prefer feature A or feature B, and you can't do both. You do a graphical representation of both variants of these headphones. You put them on a real online shop, and you add a, a button uh, saying add to basket. And then you actually track by generating traffic to this side, which variant is being added to the basket the most. The fake part of the fake door split testing, you know, comes in when, when, when you know, you don't have the product actually, you haven't developed it. So when they click the button, a small pop up comes up and it says, sorry, we don't have the product yet. We're developing it. Thanks for the interest. You'll be the first one notified. And by the way, here's a free voucher for something, something. They'll be happy. Don't worry. Let's say that you are, you want to go into the wind turbine industry and your market consists of a total of 10 really big B2B and important customers. You can do that, right? You don't, you don't shop wind turbines online. So, so what, what, what do you do? You could, one option is to try to get one customer to sign a, a joint development agreement where they put engineers and business developers into your development so that they show, yes, we think the problem you're trying to solve is important. And yes, we hope that your solution will be the one that we can use in the future. Great. We, are, we, know, we love doing these experiments with our customers and we are experimentation nerds. And we were just hoping that you would play along a little bit here and, and share with us some of the examples that you have done. Maybe some really cool ones, maybe some really hard ones, uh, some really valuable ones, also the ones that fail. So uh, hope you're ready to play along. Just write in the chat as you did before, which experiments have you tried either with success, or of course, also with failure and learning. <clears throat> Sorry, yeah. Social media campaign, yeah, yeah. pilot test, yeah, maybe you know, putting something into the market but framing it as a pilot, yeah, cool. Prototyping, yes, yes, of course. Wow, we're okay. A lot of things coming in. A small batch production, cool. That is also to can both test feasibility and viability at the same time. Yes. Cool. Conjoint study. Yeah, that's a cool one. We tried that as well a couple of times. FOW. Okay. Uh, I don't know what that stands for. Please elaborate if you have time. Maybe it says, yeah. 
Yeah, okay. We'll, we'll, yeah, we know you can't see it, but we'll, we'll try to read it out loud here. Uh, FOTW technique, infiltrator, infiltrator. That sounds uh, almost like a spy thing. Cool. Tasting sessions with experts and consumers. Yes. <laughs> Great. Show me campaigns. Wow. You tried and, um, a lot out there. This is cool stuff. Videos with the concept pitch and then customers afterwards react and show interest. Okay, thanks. Keep it going. Yes. We'll, mo we'll move on to the next part. Yes, we'll move on with the next part. And uh, here you see the rocket that we so much love. Uh, now it's time to uh, look at grow the business or scale the business. It's not really a final step, obviously, because it continues. That's uh, the life of your business, you could sort of say. But if we look into uh, scaling and growing, it means scaling the whole business system based on metered funding. And uh, this curve here, you might know this bell-shaped curve is about the life, the birth and the life and the death of a company or a business. Uh, when you are scaling or growing, you're around about here. You have had some early success, but you haven't nailed the volume market yet. And with this initial proof and uh, positivity, there's plenty of opportunity to make some really big and risky investments. So you have to fund your expansion, just like you are funding the early stuff based on the right metrics and not vanity metrics, such as likes or free giveaways and customers saying this or that. But you also have to, in the scaling process, be attentive to three areas. And we call that the solution system, the sales and the delivery system, and the people system, also known as organization. Important to say here though, is that, you know, it's one business, one team. It's not sitting in the silos like everything else in big companies is. And, but when we look into uh, the systems, if we look at the solution system first, I mean, uh, let's elaborate to a lot of this. It's of course about managing your roadmap, constantly improving the value proposition and constantly costing out so you can get that volume market. If we look into the sales and the delivery system, it's of course the sales power, the lead generation and the sales that you increase that all the time. But on your delivery system, you're moving from manual towards more and more automated, or at least more and more efficient uh, production and delivery. On the people side, it's important that uh, there's a freedom to actually move. So that means that could also be a freedom to source corporate services as needed. And if you don't need them, source them somewhere else. If you're forced to follow procedures internally, it might kill you. But then, as you know, when uh, people grow up, when youngsters grow up, they need to decide where to live. Mm -hmm. And so goes also for a little business. And it could, it could either become like a, a self, uh, you know, a standalone mini business, new business unit, or part of a, an existing business unit. In this case, it's very important to have good friends there. Or it could also become spun out, of course. So... Uh, with this, we've now been through the stepping stones in the middle part of the, of the rocket. Uh, and now we saved a very, very central foundation or fuel or energy tank to the very end. It's the team and process power, accountability, freedom, and fast process that is so important to even get anywhere. And the team and the process must merge with power and speed to overcome all the challenges they will meet. And they will meet a lot externally, but just as many internally. We need accountable and free team. And we think they're characterized by passion and accountability to create business. They're characterized by having decision authority as close as possible to the real insights. And also we need a mindset of just do it and get out of the building mentality, not hiding behind the spreadsheets or the computers being a little bit scared to talk to customers without showing anything. We need uh, knowledge on how to work the system. That's incredibly important. We can't do with a lot of you know, startup guys that don't know how to play the game. Uh, we need to have also multi-skilled teams so we avoid becoming really, really big because all functions need to be there because uh, it's part of the work. One thing we don't need is we don't need representation from functions. I've seen it go wrong many times when this is the case. It becomes political. Everybody needs to be in touch and like it or not like it. And it just uh, box it down. Important to say also that the innovation and the sponsor, i.e. the management team, they need to have exact same mindset. 
And that's not always the case, and that's a problem. The other thing we need is fast and structured process. We need metered funding, bucket funding, based on real world evidence. Les talked a ton about the evidence, but important is here the time boxing, the, the, the buckets. We need to have time boxes with freedom so that we can actually find our way and have resources and energy to find our way and don't have to produce a report every other day. <clears throat> we need also to follow what we call the science of experimentation, assumption-based testing in short loops. Whether you call it build, measure, learn or something else, we don't really care as long as it's the same. There is frequent demos and fast learning in short iterations. In other words, we need an agile process that has a built-in de-risking. So now with this, actually, we have given you a high level overview over what we see as the rational stepping stone towards growing a business. Discover problems worth solving, generating a portfolio of solution, and signing a roadmap, launching and validated the very first version of your business and growing and scaling the business. But so importantly to remember the fuel and the energy on the side that is, ne that is needed to take you to the stars or maybe the moon, which could also be good enough sometimes. The foundation is essential to get any lift at all, clarity on the why and team and process power. Thanks a lot for staying around. We sincerely hope you get your rockets flying. And like uh, we said in the, in the beginning, like Les has said, uh, we are nerds. Let's stay connect, connected. We really love to talk about these issues. We would love to hear more about what you have learned and tried when aiming for the stars. So, you know, please reach out in any way uh, for any type of discussion, questions, if you want to receive some of the material we presented, whatever. And, um, yeah, I guess it's kind of it. It oh, is, and yeah. if you would uh, really like the the uh, the slides fast, just leave us a comment here uh, in the the chat here in the bottom, or hook with uh, hook up with us on LinkedIn. Yeah, and we'll we'll yeah. make sure to prioritize and get it out really really fast. Cool. Thanks right. for staying around. Have a super nice day. Have a super day. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye.